Welcome to Voices of Care, the podcast series from New Cross Healthcare, which aims to get to the very heart of the issues facing the health and social care sector. I'm Sahel Mirza, your host, and today we'll be taking a look back at some of the highlights from the past seven episodes to round off what's been a truly dramatic 2022. From guests like Sir David Nicholson, Roisin Fallon-Williams, Professor Martin Green, Dr Jane Townsend and Mark Storey, Sir Jim Mackey, James Tugendhat and finally Steve Moore, we'll be highlighting what they have to say about the challenges, opportunities and issues facing the sector, but more importantly what solutions there are to truly enable the healthcare workforce of the future. I've been delighted to meet all our guests and I'm looking forward to meeting more in the new year. In the meantime, have a wonderful Christmas and I look forward to seeing you all in January 2023. I'd like to uh, move on to the final part uh, of our discussion to look at the bigger picture around culture, leadership, training and development and and the broader determinants uh, of health. But beginning with um, really the worrying statistics that have come out um, from the latest workforce data that showed a record number of people voluntarily leaving uh, in the first quarter of the last financial year, the record number over the last decade. So there's clearly a retention issue the NHS people plan, the people promise, this is at the centre of everything. And I think culture, you've alluded to how important that is. Sandwell and West Birmingham strategy focuses on the idea of promoting meaning and choice. And that's going to require some uh, innovative and visionary leadership. And just how important is that in terms of the culture? Well, the reality, although, you know, we bleat and complain about what the government hasn't done and all the rest of it most of the levers that we will need to improve our overall position are in our own our, in, in our own hands and um uh, you know recruitment and retention the way we support and help our people the way we train educate them all of those things are a critical part of it and increasingly the way we rethink roles Mm. in order to make sure that the workforce that we've got uh is is suitable for 21st century healthcare. so all of that is really is really important and underlying that is a leadership culture that we require i think in the in the in the jargon it's talk it's, it's, it's called compassionate and uh, inclusive and uh, the compassion is obvious you know we don't just want empathy you know we don't just want you know i i spend quite a bit of time walking talking to staff and when you say to them what are your what are the issues you know they they generally speaking their number one issue is staffing mm. you know they say that and it's often not they haven't got enough it's they haven't got enough at particular times of the day because the rotary isn't working because they're not flexible enough in way in which they operate and you know a simple thing and I assess anyone who, who, who runs, who's responsible for hospitals should think about this, is that how long it takes from someone giving their notice to replacing somebody in that job. You'll be amazed how long that takes sometimes, six months in some organisations. You know, in, in, in which time you've got a vacancy, you've got, you've got um, uh, a staffing... Um, uh, bank staff or agency staff coming in to fill it. You're, you're adding to your expenses, but you're providing a really poor relationship. And the other thing I, I say is that, on average, the two organisations I'm responsible for turn over about 10% of their staff every year. And the vast majority of that 10% go and work somewhere else in the black country. <laughs> they go and work in the hospital next door. Right. Yeah. You know, which I, you know, I, if there's another hospital that's providing more flexibility or promotion or whatever, that's a choice. That's the thing about choice. That's, that's absolutely, absolutely fine. But just the, the cost to the system of people resigning and then re- being, it's, it's, it's absolutely enormous. And so in a system wide thinking, how you can, give people passports, how you can all make all that work far better is an important thing we can practically we can practically do. Um, but unless we get a hold of the way in which we support our workforce, we're never gonna we're never gonna recruit, we're never gonna train enough people if they move if they're if they're moving out. Broadening it out a little bit, um, New Cross Healthcare have a huge commitment to be uh, a learning partner for life, encouraging anybody uh, who wants to have training to enter care 
uh, nursing profession um, free at the point of access. And what that reminded me of was in your strategy, your, your, your goal is to have a high performance workforce, upskilling and giving people true career progression. Uh, could you expand upon that? Because we into new uh, models of care, very community-based. This goes back to the five-year forward view. Shall I dare I mention that eight years later? Um, and, and new roles. So allowing that high-performance culture to flourish, what, what have been the things that you perhaps have been most proud of to allow particularly nurses, but maybe a broader workforce, to engage in that upskilling and have a career pathway that they inspires them yeah I mean I think to be perfectly honest I think it's probably slightly easier to do that for for nursing mm. than perhaps other, some of the other professional groups that we've got but I think so I think there's something about us thinking of in the multidisciplinary team perspective so putting in place something that supports us both um, in terms of encouraging people around um, being able to take on um, additional um, education and training but also aligning it to our values yeah so ensuring that actually it's it's equipping us for the culture that we want in the organization so those things i talked about around so one of our values is inclusivity um, and that fits very much with our anti-racist anti-discriminatory work so we need our leadership development programs to to align to that as well so whilst giving people an opportunity to to gain additional training and expertise we're aligning it all the time back to what we want culturally in the organization I'd like to jump straight in. Um, I want to spare your blushes, but I think it's about 10 years ago that you received an OBE for your services to social care. And yet I've got a sense of deja vu where 10 years later, the Health and Social Care Committee is bemoaning a workforce crisis. We've got stats coming out showing vacancies at record levels. And New Cross Healthcare's care survey commissioned commissioning YouGov, uh, finds that over one in four, 27% of care workers surveyed, are likely to leave the sector over the next 12 months. Can you shed some light on the sheer extent of the workforce challenge across residential care? Yes, I think we are in one of the worst positions that we have been in many, many years. And recent data from Skills for Care showed clearly that the workforce challenge is enormous. They said that on any one day, there are about 160,000 vacancies across social care. So I think that gives you some understanding of how challenging the situation is. It's also interesting to note how many people are considering leaving the sector. And of course, not only is it a very complex and challenging role, Role, but we've all just been through a global pandemic and social care was on the very front line of that. And I think a lot of people are starting to think about whether or not they can go on because of the stresses that they encountered during the COVID crisis. To allow you to expand upon that, Jane, some of you, obviously your members are faced with the, the constraints that they have, but there's been some great work which you've highlighted in some of your research in terms of career development and offering a, a skills pathway for people within home care. Yeah, I think, you know, Mark's right that um, the, the skills required, um, they're many and varied. And during the pandemic, we saw more tasks being delegated to home care workers because other professionals like GPs, district nurses, social workers were told to remain at home as much yep. as possible. Um, and unfortunately, in some cases, those expectations were placed without the training. So having access to training is very welcome. What was, I, I, I feel excited by the opportunities for Building on that, um, the, the, the technologies for remote health monitoring, we're seeing the NHS focus more on hospital at home services that they're calling anticipatory care. But that's the idea of uh, identifying people with complex needs and focusing on preventative work with them. And yesterday, I was also at a meeting when NHS colleagues were talking about sort of nationally commissioning intermediate care in, in a structured way, which it has been done before, but kind of piecemeal. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole mood music is, can we sh shift to a more community focus? And that's, that's very welcome. But there are more sort of challenges about accessing training with a remote workforce and with people that are very busy and, and the, the, you know the the the, the sh shorter you are of labor the harder it is to find time to do the training so you know we've noticed that there's been an increase in, in appetite for 
online forms of learning as well, because you can be very flexible about that. But there, you know, the kind of um, things that some of our members are doing, you know, for example, um, when you've got the data that 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 comes from digital, you can see what's going on more clearly. So they noticed with their particular client group that people were ending up in hospital with urinary tract infections that hadn't been uh, diagnosed early enough. And what would happen before was that the uh, doctors would sort of say, or, or the, the care worker would phone up and say, oh, Betty's a bit off colour. Um, and the GP would say, well, just leave her for a few days. You know, she might pick up. Mm. But what the uh, provider did was train their staff in doing some simple physiological observations, you know, temperature um, and doing urine dip tests. So they're not diagnosing, but when they phone the GP, they say, you know, Betty's off color. I've done a urine dip test. This was the result. I've done the temperature. This was the result. And they found that the GPs then were much more willing to prescribe straight away. And they reduced unplanned admissions to hospital by 63% just from doing that, which is really simple. So if you imagine scaling that kind of approach, um, and, you know, all kinds of other areas, you know, dementia, diabetes, care, you know, n nobody in care is trying to diagnose or do anything clinical, but you can, they can work under the direction. And what we'd really like to see, I think, are more multidisciplinary teams on the ground, because in practice, that's what happens, you know, mm. that the care workers talking to the district nurses, the social workers, the hospital staff, it, it's all a little bit ad hoc. If, if everybody felt that they were part of a team, and, and I like the anticipatory care idea because of that. And then we can organize the training to support that as mm. a team. That would start to make quite a big difference because then you start to get that res mutual respect as well. No, no, thank you for that. I think it's important for people to understand what has been delivered, as you say, during extraordinary circumstances. And the other good thing I think that comes out, as you said, people are willing to talk about wellness, well-being, and it should be in a balanced manner. I wanted to broaden the sub subject to, we're, we're still talking about workforce, we're still talking about meeting inexorable demand. And of course, technology plays a hugely important role in helping clinicians and indeed non-clinicians uh, meet those requirements. There's so much I could cover, but a couple of things that really struck me about um, the work at the Trust, one, one is to do with obviously the surgical robots that you've got, but before that, it's some of the innovative work around data, AI, patient pathways. I think uh, Professor Mike Reed, Dr. Justin Green's work, uh, can you give us some light on that? Because the goal there is to, as you say, upstream, make things more effective so that the pressure on the system is actually averted. Yeah, so the again, one of the benefits of the last few years across the whole of the NHS and actually healthcare internationally is people have really embraced technology in a different way. It's accelerated a lot of things. I mean, just the simple things like this and uh, virtual interactions with patients pre-COVID, it's very difficult to do. It wasn't being done on any kind of scale, but it has absolutely transformed how people work and created more convenient interactions uh, in an appropriate uh, context and setting. We've got, like a lot of organizations as well, really going big on the robot thing. We've got a slightly different feel here because of our surgical mix, where robots generally in healthcare have been massively used in neurology. We're really big in colorectal surgery, so there's massive progress there in neurology as well, but in other specialties. Uh, you mentioned Mike Reed's work, which is uh, fantastic in AI and orthopedics. Uh, which is uh, really interesting, quite uh, interesting and unique, um, I think, in terms of that development. We're trialling uh, drones in certain parts of our population to see how useful they can be to move things around in rural, uh, rural areas. Uh, we're on the edge of, uh, of signing up to a, a triage tool using AI in an AD setting. And then you've got all the virtual ward stuff and other things that are going on out in the, the NHS. We've used the AI and validation mechanisms in the electric program um, over the last year or so as well. So there's a lot of really brilliant innovation going on. And I think, again, through history, a lot of big surgical clinical advances have happened in extremists, you know, during wartime or other traumatic events. And I think probably the last couple of years has, has unleashed a bit of a technological leap in how we use data, how we generate data, how we use 
AI and process automation to support uh, clinical colleagues. And that won't, you know, it's, they're not either or as well. So these are things about how we um, protect clinical um, skills and expertise and use them appropriately, supported by technology, not necessarily uh, replacing them fully by that as well. And I think we are genuinely a, a really interesting point uh, in healthcare with that. And time will, will tell. Um, you've talked about uh, the demand and the need for workers now. The Health and Social Care Committee uh, delivered its report in July, of course, which you're familiar with. Um, its estimates drawing on uh, think tank uh, research is that over the next decade or so, we need 490,000 yeah. more workers within care. Um, and there is a recruitment challenge, if, despite uh, the, the promotion of parity of esteem. Uh, the New Cross Healthcare Survey found that 67% of, of those considering entering social care didn't know how to navigate their way into the yes. sector. Um, I wanted to touch upon a really important initiative that HC1 has been delivering, which is the Rewarding Career Campaign. Yeah. It's been a, a, you've been shortlisted for a number of awards. Can you expand upon the philosophy behind that and the practice that, uh, that's evolved? So one of the great pleasures of my job is spending time with our colleagues in our homes. And for most of uh, our colleagues, the biggest single group of our colleagues, are long-serving. Because for them, care's not a job, it's not even a profession, it's a vocation. Mm. That they know the power of the love that they can give and the love that they can get and wouldn't contemplate doing anything else. And what we wanted to help showcase and demonstrate, both through that campaign but in how we manage recruitment, is all that is so deeply rewarding at an emotional level um, about care, but also to take uh, a position on reward as well as recognition so that we were able to both as a business and working with the sector as a sector to step towards pay that truly recognises the skill and the commitment of those that deliver the care. Absolutely. And I'm uh, interested to, that you use the four letter word, uh, the love that can be given. Uh, and it really truly is a vocation for people that choose this pathway. It is. And whilst being a vocation and whilst being deeply rewarding, it is also a really physically demanding job. It's a very skilled job. And back to some of what you and I have talked about over the years around training and development, it's a job that if you're not properly equipped to do, is going to be even more challenging and, and at times emotionally confronting. And so what we want to do in, de in talking about rewarding careers is to show that there's a career path mm -hmm. in showing the career development, in showing the growth, in showing that the financial rewards need to be there, um, but most of all in preparing you for a life as a carer and demonstrating that, you know, our most senior managers all started um, you know, in uh, homes, in rooms, doing the care. And sticking with the retention point, um, you've alluded it, uh, to it earlier, um, and uh, we can't avoid the question of uh, wellness, well-being, burnout. Uh, it's been an extraordinary couple of years. I think it's going to be an extraordinary couple of years ahead. Your your well-being objectives are set out quite quite clearly. 2022, 2023, reduce uh, staff turnover, increase uh, staff workforce engagement. I, I know you've done a lot over the COVID period, but can you expand upon that wellness, well-being? It, these are not nice to haves. These are must haves in terms of the workforce retention challenge. Yeah, absolutely, and that that became really clear as we as we talked to our staff and worked through the the pandemic. You know, the amount of pressure that people were feeling uh, on the front line. One of the key things that came out of those discovery reports that I mentioned was the importance of giving people access to nature, which might sound a bit strange in a in a beautiful rural part of Wales like we live in. But um, giving people time out in the day job to access nature, we, uh, we supported that. We set up community gardens. And actually, for those people who were most at risk of burnout, we've also established return to nature courses that we support. We give people time out of work. And we've had some really good feedback from people about how that feels. I mean, that together with some of the other things that we're, we're doing around retention, which relates to people being able to work at the top of their license and develop, as we've talked about 
uh, where we've now seen that Hawadar has gone from one, having one of the highest um, turnover rates to one of the lowest in Wales now. So we know that it works, but actually we've got to continue to maximise all of those opportunities.